Hello, everyone. Hey. Hello. Hi. Hey. My name is Klaus, and normally I give extremely tight presentations with excellent slides for something like an hour. I'd have about 300 slides or so that I click through with lightning speed. Sadly, my computer didn't agree with me today, so not only am I three minutes late, because I needed to get to grips with the fact that it wasn't happening, the export was not only not happening, the backup was also not happening. So I'm going to do this slideless today. However, I'm going to use a few videos and a little bit of internet. Luckily, you guys are at the IT University, so internet is available. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> More or less. So, first off, what is LARP? How many of you can give a good answer to that question? A good answer? You can try. That's yeah. also good enough. It's a lot better than everybody else who's just sitting there going, uh, I know. I'd say it's, it's taking on a, a role and using your own body as, you know, you, you act out the role literally and um, you are together with other people taking on their roles. No. And, you know, play that. <laughs> you basically play that role. Right? You basically play role. It's not a bad answer. LARP is short for live action role play. And basically, it's pretending to be somebody else doing something else somewhere else. That's kind of a, the, the best and shortest definition that I've come up with yet. And that means it can be anything. It can be orcs and elves in the forest. It can be the United Nations delegation meeting with me as a, an African dictator trying to explain why should you should not boycott my country. And you as delegates from the civilized world. This would be easy to imagine. It could just as well be the briefing on an intergalactic spaceship where we're deciding whether we're going to bomb the Earth first or some weird planet nobody's heard of, and you're all playing aliens. It could also be playing house, father, mother, and children, as most kids do. That's the first LARP that most kids uh, get acquainted with, that is playing house. You say you're going to play for some time, somebody's going to be the mother, somebody's going to be the father, somebody's going to be the kids. The sister wants to complain that she just wants to play soccer, and uh, the small boy wants to do homework, and the mother's complaining she has to earn all the money, and the father says, why does he always have to do the cooking? This is simple, it's a kid's game, it's let's pretend. It's something we've all tried, it's something we know how it functions. The difference between that and LARP as we do it, for adults or also for kids, is just that what we do is a little bit more organized, we usually have some nicer costumes, and it's a little bit more complex story-wise. Because, of course, playing house as a kid is something you usually do for 10 minutes or half an hour or one hour. But there are very few recorded games of five kids playing house for 72 hours. And the longer the game goes on, the more people disagree on what's actually happening. Because while it might be fun to be the dog at the beginning, after half an hour it gets a little bit boring just going woof, woof, and nobody wants to walk in. So, what we do is basically children's pretend games, except a little bit more advanced. Now, what does that mean? And why is that interesting for you guys? Is a good question. Why do you think it's interesting? Why are you here is a good thing to ask. This is something very few of your normal lecturers will ask you because they really don't want to hear the answers, but I actually do. Why are you here instead of doing something else that's interesting with your life? And saying, I just stumbled upon the room because I was going to be somewhere else is a good answer. Saying the guy in the front row with the camera is cute is also a good answer. But there might also be other reasons. So why are you here? Yes, and I'm one of these evil people who actually ask questions and want answers. So when I ask something, it's because I want actual interaction. Yes, why are you in this room at this time? Because I briefly was asking myself what the answer is, and it's interesting how I'm well understood what I'm studying, what I'm doing, what I'm studying, what I'm doing, what I'm studying, what I'm doing, 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 what i am no, it's just because... Or just not listening, that's okay. No. Yeah, I was doing not, but um, I'm taking a, a game course, and uh, I'm not in the game uh, program, so I think it can help me with getting more inside of the, of the game uh, in real, whatever. Yeah. 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 Just let it, let it slide. We'll take more later. So, that gives us a good place to start. Game studies, or games in general. 
Next question for the esteemed audience. With what I just explained, is LARP a game? Yes. Um, in itself, I guess not. Um, but, you know, uh, the whole drama and conversation thing uh, usually meets games and rules uh, and an intersection. Uh, and, and that in itself is very interesting because then the drama starts to influence. And, and so, understanding that end of the spectrum, the, the, the pure systemless uh, role playing, um, you know, is. Ought to be very beneficial for all of us and all we want to game to see. So that's why I'm here. Excellent answer. To get an insight into the role playing part. Usually we say that what we do is somewhere between game, theater, and art. And the arts and stuff we just put on so we can take ourselves seriously and get art money grants. Because saying something is art doesn't really say a lot, except that you had some purpose with doing it. And that goes the same for computer games, or for sculptures, or for hip-hop, or for this dance. Then you can always discuss, is it good art, or is it bad art? But just discussing whether something is art in itself is rather meaningless. So we tag the third, the, the art thing on, just because we want to feel that we're taken seriously. So that brings us with somewhere between theater and game. Because when we usually do LARPs, whether they're about the United Nations, or about uh, alcoholic, homeless alcoholics, or about orcs and elves, we add some kind of structure to it. I could, of course, just tell you guys, you're now homeless alcoholics, and uh, I'm your career counselor, and of course, for you, it's all about getting as much money out of the system as possible, and these are your characters. Pretend to be a homeless, pretend to be yourself as a homeless person. This would be rather easy and straightforward, but to make it a little bit more interesting, we would add some character goals, and we would add a little bit of game mechanics, Maybe that uh, the closer you move to the stage, the better you are socially. So if I decide that somebody is, is moving up in society or has a better chance of getting a job at the end of it, I'm going to ask them to move so you have some kind of visual representation of how things are going for your character. That would be an, an easy and simple game to run. And the reason I call it game is because we come from a game background. So even while what we do as LARPers is basically just pretend play, we still have grown out of... Uh, board games and uh, tabletop role-playing games with massive dice systems and roll a small dice to see if you hit the orc uh, or seduce the vampire or whatever it is you're doing. And we also come from a, a kind of a, 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 a small figures on boards war game background where the first, the first role-playing game started. The first role-playing game started in the 70s with some people playing tabletop warfare simulation, small metal figures moving them across the table. Uh, rolling dice to see who hits who, and at some point somebody decided, or at least so goes the legend, that uh, there would be a third person instead of just being the referee or the guy hanging out getting the coffee, he would kind of make up a story meanwhile. So the Roman legionnaires said, okay, we're going to pray to to the gods before the game, and then the, the referee decided, okay, that's a, you're good, doing a good prayer, and then sapped one of the units and removed the soldiers from the battlefield. And some of them were so excited by this that you could have a kind of a storytelling game that they decided to take this further, that instead of the focus being on the game part, the focus became on the storytelling part. And then you just use the dice to, to kind of resolve conflict or random events or so. And at some point, also in the 70s, 80s, some people decided, let's not just pretend that we're elves and heroes and vampires sitting around a table saying, my vampire climbs the stairs in a squeaky manner. And everybody goes, oh, and pictured it up here. Then they decide, let's dress up and let's go out and pretend to be vampires or pretend to be elves or pretend to be space pirates or whatever. Of course, the problem with this is that unlike the imagination, which has an unlimited budget, my uh, me thinking that I'm a vampire is very persuasive or at least very convincing in my own head, while me uh, pretending to be a vampire as Klaus is slightly less. My skin doesn't glitter that much. Um, I may have problems when it comes to seducing teenage girls. Sort of vampire stuff comes hard to me. So, of course, going out and pretending to do something gives some extra elements. On the other hand, you sacrifice a little bit of the believability, a little bit of the immersion for it. Now, why is this interesting to you guys? It is interesting because while LARPs were like that in the 70s and 80s, people like me being 20 years younger, dressing up in uh, somebody's bed sheets and uh, waving around foam swords that look very ugly, a little bit of stuff has happened since then. And uh, 
Yes. Okay. This shows that I don't work here normally. Now, what you're about to see is uh, a LARP event that I'm going to be doing in two weeks, based on the series, or at least inspired by the series, Downton Abbey. So this is set in 1914 England, and there are no orcs in sight, but people play servants and nobles and the doctor from the village, the local priest, that sort of thing. And this is a this is not scenes from the actual event because we haven't run it yet, but this is some kind of a mood trailer to get an idea of this is what it could be like. And this is of course filmed at the actual location we're going to use using actual costumes we're going to use. So this is kind of what it can look like. So this is some of the stuff I do. Question. Was the mansion rented or it belonged to one of the players? It's rented. It's rented. It's a hotel by day. So basically we rent the entire hotel, pay some extra to make sure there are no tourists, and uh, then decorate it uh, so it, it uh, kind of fits the theme a little bit better. And this is of course just one example. It might have been anything. It might have been about Robin Hood, the Three Musketeers, or it might have been uh, set on a spaceship, or it might have been uh, an orc camp. I like orcs, that's why I mention them all the time. The advantage with doing stuff like this is that it's multi-sensory. Basically, one of the things that any game strives for, or at least that I will say that any game strives for, is that you want to get a feeling of immersion. You want to feel that you're somehow there, or you want to lose yourself in the action. That doesn't matter whether you're playing Civilization, the computer game, or whether you're playing Monopoly, the board game, where you really want to feel like an evil capitalist stockbroker buying houses, or you're playing more uh, abstract stuff like Yahtzee. I'm not sure what you're supposed to feel you are when you play Yahtzee, because the narrative isn't that strong in it. But you're at least supposed to forget about what you're doing and become immersed in the game. Now, if you all disagree with this, now is the time to tell me, because if not, then I will build on this as a point. So if you think, no, I don't buy that at all then let me hear, because I might change my mind. Good. Then we will proceed as if that is at least partly true. So, as I said, what we do is multi-sensory. There's taste, there's smell, there's visuals, there's audio, there's touch. Now, usually when people do games, or when they do experiences of some sort, there's not, you don't use all five senses. TV is nice, or films are nice, because you get visuals and you get sound. But it's rather seldom that you get to see, when you see the Rocky movie, that somebody punches you in the face. You may see what's going on on screen, and you may feel that, uh, what's his face, uh, Sylvester Stallone is really getting beat up, and you may feel some kind of uh, identification with the character. You may even cry if it, if it kind of hits hard enough, or you may laugh, but you're not there. And there's no doubt about that. You're a spectator. Not only don't you feel the punches, which is sometimes very nice, or fewer people would see Rocky movies, I guess, uh, you also cannot influence the story, and you can't touch it, and you can't smell it. So that's why when people do games, often they try to see if they in any way can get use of extra senses. The difference between silent movies and movies with sound was quite big, because for some odd reason, looking at it, screen with no sound on is in no way the same as looking at a screen with sound on. And the moment somebody starts getting touch and smell, or at least smell in there, which sounds like it might be the next obvious thing to put in movies, then there are some people who are of course going to say, no, we don't want that, I don't want to smell the shit from Stalingrad while I'm watching Stalingrad. But others will go, yes, this feels so real, I was almost there. Because using extra senses means that you get to feel more like you're there. Now. Can any of you give me an example of a five-sensory activity that is very popular? Something where you use all five senses. It doesn't have to be a game, though some people consider it a game. It's rather popular. Global, one might say, has been around for some years. 
I've read an article that there's something wrong with the basic game design, but most people seem to go along fine. Yes? I don't know if this is what you're aiming for, but I was, because you were mentioning a movie that thought you have the seven Ds right now, or five D or four D or different things where you're going to live more than. Yep. Yeah, I, I've never figured out what the six and seven D is, but. Uh, no, but I tried something similar and I, you could smell it. Yes, 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 exactly. And was it cool? Exactly. And the first time sound came on, it was awesome. And we're trying to get 3D uh, cinemas is an excellent example of it. It's, of course, still visual, but you get a little bit of the depth feel. And we, of course, it is uh, more wider, widely accepted mainstream sorts of uh, role-playing games, such as Sony Rollins. Yep, yep, yep. Stuff like that. Very, very popular. Because you get to use as many, you get to use all five senses. And no matter how cool something is that you just look at, it's hard beating something that you look at, you smell it, you touch it, you maybe even eat it. Of course, there's a lot of stuff where it gets a little bit problematic getting uh, touch and, and uh, uh, taste into it. But if you were if you were able to to get something where you not only played the burger chef in the board game, but you also got to eat the burgers, I think that would be a lot more fun if you're going to do a game about being a burger chef, of course. So one of the reasons what we do is very popular is because it uses all five senses. Basically, you you get all sorts of stimulus that you can. The answer I was looking for before, and that's because you're such clean, nice young kids that nobody answered, is of course sex, where you use all five senses. Very popular. Um, you, we can always discuss the set of game design, but even though nobody really, or some people do something to kind of spice it up, just the basic features of getting to do something fun with all five senses works rather well for most people. It's been around for some time, and probably will for some time yet. And you can always discuss what's sex 2.0 or 3.0 or 4.0, but it will be people like you, and it's not only fun, for fun that I mention it, it will be people like you who are going to be designing the future of sex. And Japan will buy it. Yeah, 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 exactly. And because we're getting closer to, can, uh, can we design robotic sex? Is that dual? What about virtual reality stuff? And, and the moment somebody invents some, some kind of technology that can do something, somebody's going to figure out a way to use it in their sex life. And any kind of thing like that needs some kind of design. And I think some of that is going to be up to people like you, maybe not the people in this room, if that's not your particular field of interest. But people sort of like you will be helping do stuff like this. If not as the whole thing, at least then part of it as the thing. Because, of course, in the Downton Abbey game from before, if you get to have romance as part of it, it's not like we're having actual sex at the castle. This is not what I'm saying. But there's some kind of romance mechanic, and getting to have a fake flirt is no different than getting to have a flirt with a character from a movie, except here they actually flirt back. You can hold their hand. So people fall in love with movie characters or computer game characters all the time. Here they meet actual living human beings, and that makes it a lot easier. And this is something that we want as experiences. So, next piece of thing. This is a thing for kids. So this was a little bit different. This was a small one-day game with about 100 kids. 30 of them we picked up off the street, not because they were uh, in drug traffic or any of that sort of stuff, just because they were on the street and walked past and thought, oh, this looks interesting, can we be a part of this? The basic story was very simple. Some mythological beings or mythological figures were scattered around the plaza, the location of the place, and this mythical cult wanted to steal their identities. And as said in the video, it's hard to be a legend if nobody knows where you are. So the kids had to find these mythological people and figure out who they were, learn something about who they were, and get their identities back from the cult. This took a couple of hours, involved something like 110, 115 people or so, was rather fun and silly, and the kids got to meet, uh, they got to meet uh, one of the three musketeers, they got to meet the Southern American butterfly goddess, which, whose name I cannot pronounce and never could. They got to meet a Japanese samurai, they got to meet an uh, Persian uh, warrior queen, and some other people. And of course, the idea here was to have fun, but also to educate. Not every game needs to be educational. 
But you'll find, if you haven't already found so, that it's a lot easier getting people to accept games if they serve some kind of purpose besides pure entertainment. Sometimes people's money sits a little bit sits a little bit looser when you say, "Oh, but they also learn something from it." Not always, but sometimes. And of course, we battle with the same stuff. And even stuff that's just made to be entertaining, or even stuff you go into just to be entertained, you can still learn stuff from it. I know that when I sat down and started playing Civilization, the computer game, back in uh, when it came out many, many years ago, this was like early uh, early '90s. I didn't really play it because I wanted to learn about world history or figure out how bronze working actually functions. But I learned a lot of stuff from that game, a lot of stuff that served me well later. Because not only was it fun to play, it was also rather educational. And this is something that is, is interesting to think into any kind of game, at least I think it is. And uh, sometimes your lives will be easier if you think the same. And it's also something where LARP is an excellent example because the kids say, you see the two interviews, they basically just want to beat the crap out of each other. That's what most of them are there for. And then you kind of slide in the education stuff on the side. Because if they're having fun beating up the red team, and you tell them the red team is actually the, the 40 robbers of Alibaba and tell them the Alibaba story, then there's a better chance they're going to remember that. And if you just sit them down and say, now I'm going to tell you about Alibaba and the 40 robbers, and they'll say, why should we even listen to you? Well, if you give them rubber swords first, there's a better chance they're going to listen, because then you also bring something fun. So that's something that is not in any way unique to LARP, but LARP is an excellent example of, that if you hide your purpose, or at least disguise your purpose a little bit, then your game design will, in general, be better. This is the most crazy project I've done so far. And as you can see, the documentary promo has a little over one million hits on YouTube. Because when we did this, it's a Harry Potter part. We did this about a year ago, and had a, a British film crew there filming. They put together this 100 second small trailer from the game, and it went viral. That was a little bit crazy. So it, this has been on uh, MTV, Fox News, Good Morning America, USA Today, Weird News in Taiwan, featured in, in newspapers in Ecuador, the whole shebang. That was a little bit of a surreal experience. Um, and one of the interesting things about it is not only that I get to brag crazily about it every time I go anywhere and talk about LARP, but more relevantly for you guys is... What do you think people wrote? Because, of course, it links to a website, and some people wrote us. What kind of mails do you think we got? Did anyone... So of course, we got the obvious ones who said, can I try this, or what does it cost, or when is the next one, or what happens here? But we also got some interesting stuff. There were people who thought that we ran a real magic school in Poland, where you can learn real magic. Yesterday, I got one of these mails from somebody saying, Hi, I know this is probably a stupid mail, and you're probably getting thousands of mails, but uh, do you teach real magic, and do you know real magic? Because I have these experiences with, I sometimes see stuff, and I feel stuff, and I know you probably can't help me, but maybe you can, so I thought it was better writing than not writing. This is actual stuff. We got a mail from a, a shaman from Peru called Thomas Whitey, who we will never forget, if not because we make fun of him all the time who wrote and asked if it was a real magic school. We wrote, no, it, it was just pretending. He said, ah, but everybody who goes there secretly wants to be a real wizard. I said, I'm not so sure about that, but good luck in your travels. And he said he was quite sure, and if, if I changed my mind, then he was open for cooperation, because it took between three and 20 years to learn real magic. Very specific amount of time, to my way of thinking. But this was something. There are people who think it's an actual college where we teach using uh, kind of the Harry Potter fiction, but it's an all-year college, and ask what kind of books you need for tuition, and how much, or for, for classes, and how much tuition is. There are people who think it's a reality TV show. There are people who think that this is, uh, well, one thing is they think it's weird, but that this is uh, footage from a new Harry Potter movie. We also got that. That people thought, okay, this is for kind of Harry Potter number eight. This is apparently some footage for that. The point is, people don't know what the fuck is going on. And you, as game designers, whatever you end up doing, whether it's digital or whether it's analog or somewhere in between, you will not always be in the position where people clearly know what they're approaching is a game or that it's even a designed experience. And this is sometimes a little bit annoying, even though it's fun answering mails 
from uh, 14-year-olds who want to be real witches. It uh, gets a little bit weird at times. But it's also efficient because it means that you learn that you try to design something. And not only are you going to get misunderstood, no matter what you design, you're also going to have people who don't use the same framework of thinking as you do, or as I do, and who don't kind of split the world into the same thing. So when you say that you're studying game design, well, what does that actually mean? We usually, when we're not talking about game design, we're talking about experience design, or just design in general. This, what we're doing right now, is this a game? Probably not. We could make it into a game if I said something about how you scored points or how you won, or at least how you, in any way, what kind of rules framework we had. But right now, we agree it's not really a game, what we're doing right now. Is it an experience? Sure. A good one, a bad one, we can always argue about that. But it's definitely an experience. And it's a designed experience. I didn't just walk in the door and then randomly start talking. Okay, maybe it felt like I walked in the door and started randomly talking, but I had some idea what I was going to say beforehand. This is a designed experience. Now, next question is, is it a well-designed experience? Will you go from this room with the experience I wanted to give you? Or was my idea to give you a better understanding of existentialism and Jean-Paul Sartre? If that was my plan, then I designed this experience really badly, because this is the first time I mentioned either Sartre or existentialism. So, if that was my goal, let's just say that I'm a bad designer. If we concede that I was probably not talking about this, but talking about LARP and kind of design philosophy in general, then it becomes a whole other ballgame. Maybe I'm still a bad designer. Maybe you're going to go out and say, yeah, I don't really know what went on in there, but we're getting the SU anyway, right? Or you may go out and say, ah, maybe there were some points. Maybe we should look more into this large stuff, or maybe we should consider going to some to get inspired, even though what we're doing has nothing to do with, with large, even though we want to do apps or we want to do big uh, blockbuster AAA games or interactive movies. That's up to you guys. I, I will neither judge nor have any strong opinions on that. But on this thing, one of the reasons LARP is interesting is the stuff I mentioned before, but also because it's rather scalable in a way that most digital media is not. Running something like this, of course, is a little bit complex. First, you have to rent the castle. That costs some money. You have to get the players. You have to do a shitload of stuff to make it work. But doing a LARP where you are four players playing uh, friends on a double date, and the only thing you know from the beginning is that somebody's going to murder somebody else at the end of it. It doesn't take a lot of time. It's very easily doable. You can do it at home. You can do it at a restaurant, though I would not uh, advise that if you're going to actually fake murder stuff, murder people. Or you could do it in the cantina here. But it's scalable. We could easily have a one hour, one hour lesson of... Uh, combat magic or ethics of sorcery or how to treat minotaur wounds. We could easily have that right here with you guys playing students and me instead of talking about this or about some kind of data bridges, talking about how to deal with enraged minotaurs. That sort of thing is easy. While if you're doing a digital game, it's usually very hard to just do some small stuff. So that means that even though iterative design and kind of doing prototypes and then moving onwards is getting better and better, it's rather hard saying, how about we just crank up the new... Uh, Call of Duty game, or Total War game, or the new Sims game. Just test it a bit, and then we kind of move on to the next thing. Can you maybe do a 30-minute Sims game for us we can run tomorrow? No, it doesn't really work that way. You need to build a shitload of stuff into making even the most basic stuff work. So here, what you can do is you can make some experiences rather cheaply, rather simply, and then you can figure out what's the fun part of this, and then see if you can emulate it in some kind of more structured manner. And to that, I will give you an example from a Swedish convention. It's called Waiting for Pekka. This is a small game made by a, a horribly uh, arrogant game designer friend of mine, who also teaches game design studies. And what he basically did was he took four players who had signed up for his game. They just knew it was called Waiting for Pekka. They didn't know what they were going to do. Then at this role-playing convention where people are going all places, some are in the bar, some are in the cafe, some are going to play games or board games or just hanging out. So he set them on a bench in the middle of the, the central area where people were passing back and forth and says, you are now four drunken Finns and you are waiting for Pekka to come with the booze. Go! And then he left. And then 15 minutes later he came back and then he set down a small stereo recorder with weird sounds and says, let the music influence your characters. And then he left. And for him, it was an experiment. 
he wanted to see how long time it would take for the players to revolt against the game structure and say, this is fucking bullshit, and find him and say, why did you waste our time, or what was this? This was his, his experiment. Four hours later, he comes back. They're still sitting on the bench. They're having a shitload of fun. Pekka has not arrived, because there is no Pekka. <laughs> the serial thing, the tape on it, has kind of uh, long since has played out. But they're still having a shitload of fun pretending to be drunken Finns sitting on a bench waiting for Pekka to come with the booze. Now, what does this say about game design? The reason that Tobias, his name is Tobias, the reason he usually mentions the story is that when we do game design, we have all sorts of ideas of what will be cool or what will be interesting, but we really don't know until we test it. We, this might work for them, it might work horribly for others, but some of the stuff when we do game design is figuring out ways to do short, easy ideas and then take the good stuff from those ideas and copy it on a bigger scale. It's not that he went on to make uh, the new Farmville called Drunken Fins played on Facebook, but figuring out that there is, even for the simplest of games or the simplest of experiences, there is an audience. And sometimes if you manage to hit that audience, well, then you can do it. It at least inspired him to do something like this on a bigger scale, or kind of reproduce the experiment with other players. And now there are several people who have played Waiting for Pekka. Some of them have played it because we, others of us who didn't invent it or weren't even there, but have used it on kind of youth school class training or company team building stuff as examples of what can also be a game or what can also be a designed experience. So that's something that Warps is good for, because if you do the same thing with a computer game, you would have to do some, it's not easy to program a computer game where you're four drunken fins waiting for your fifth friend to appear and he never does. That takes a little bit longer than me saying, you, 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 and you. You're now four drunken fins, you now sit down here, you're waiting for Pekka, and then I leave the room. So you have, you have an ease of design and an ease of testing that very few other kind of game-like activities give you. So that's one thing I want you to take with you. That even if you're not going to go out and say, wow, we now want to do a cross-bred uh, LARP online, more uh, MMORPG, okay? Uh, we don't want to do something like that with, with uh, LARP events and then the online stuff and uh, interactive theater or what kind of what will have you. Even if you don't want to do that, use something like this to test out simple ideas and realize that if they work kind of on a simple small scale, then they might also work on a bigger scale. The second is getting some inspiration, finding out how powerful it actually is to be there, realizing that even though you're just playing somebody's brother or boyfriend or sibling or whatever, then you can still have real feelings and seeing a way to copy that into your own stuff. We had people at the, the Harry Potter game. I've sat with a, with a 45-year-old woman who was crying because it had evoked all her high school angst from when she was in, uh, when she started at college. She didn't know she had these feelings break down, but she realized that this was not, this for her didn't really, wasn't really that fun because it reminded her of how her high school, kind of early college life was. And usually it takes a little bit to get there. Sure, you can do it with movies. Sure, you have people who are crying when somebody dies and saving Private Ryan or Titanic or whatever floats your boat. But getting actual emotions engaged is hard. And for this, you actually can. And if you can copy some of that stuff as game designers, whether LARP is your medium or something else, then you come a long way. And of course, round off, there is the simplest and easiest reason why this is going to be relevant for you. How many of you know of the Boyd Project? Yeah, you will know. Now, these are the people we're going to have to compete against in the future, all of us who do any kind of game stuff. These are the people we're going to have to work with in some way or the other, and these are the people we're going to have to be inspired by, and who hopefully will be inspired by us. Not necessarily the team behind the void, but virtual reality, augmented reality, gamification of all sorts. There's going to be more of it. It's not exactly something that's going downhill, especially as technology becomes better, and as more nerdy generations grow up and get political power and cultural capital, yada, yada, yada. 
and things become more accepted. So the whole trend of gamification, of more uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, that sort of thing, it's just going to be on the rise. And for you people, as future game designers or at least game thinkers in some way, just maybe a little bit, you're going to have to deal with stuff like this or create stuff like this or at least be aware of stuff like this. And it's very obvious that this The Void thing is designed by people who come from a computer game background who just want to make the computer games feel more real. Because if, if I had gotten my money in that sort of tech, I would do it a little bit differently. I wouldn't put them, give them glasses on. I'd just create more stunning visual environments and hidden tech. And, or you can actually use a force push, if, force push if you're a Jedi or unlock stuff with your mind. We'll come to the fun stuff when we get the tech for it. But whatever, the, the, whatever you may feel about this sort of thing is that this is happening and it's going crazily fast. And one of the most analog places that's out there that still managed to give strong experiences is stuff like what we're doing. So for no other reason than that, you should at least be aware that LARP exists and it can do some stuff. And now I've talked a lot longer than I was originally planning. Thank you for still staying awake, even those who are having a hard time. Since we have seven minutes, even for those who are in a hurry, that leaves us plenty of time for questions, because usually there aren't that many questions. People are dead or just don't want to say anything. Too much interaction already. But it means we have time now. So if you have any questions, now is the time for them. Yes? Uh, when you were telling about those people who thought that the, the Harry Potter thing is something, do you ever felt like answering to them that yes, this is a real universe, they come and join in? Okay. Sure, sure, sure. We, we thought about that. Okay. Sadly, we are way too moral for that. Okay. I thought it was safe. But it was tempting. All of this technology, not necessarily virtual reality, but technology in general, things smaller, more efficient, cheaper. Um, what, what do you think it, it, it can offer a live action role playing game, and, and at what point does it stop becoming a live action role playing game? One of the smart things is physical game. One of the smart things is it never stops. Even if I take out, if I put on my Oculus glasses or my whatever, then I'm still, I'm still playing the game. But what it does is that it makes stuff possible in games that was not possible before. In 2013, I did a run of a uh, LARP about an advertising agency. So people played uh, creative types at an ad advertising agency, a little bit like kind of Mad Men just set in, in uh, present day Copenhagen. And it was a soulless ad agency. So they never said no to any task because of moral reasons. So the, the company would get, uh, would get orders to make an image makeover for an African dictator or the new My Little Pony sex toy or a euthanasia campaign using lolcats, which was also one of the jobs. And they would come up with ideas for it and pitch to customers and then kind of live there, sleep there, or party there. This was run originally in 2003. And in 2003, they had uh, an intranet, which was done on a billboard where they wrote stuff. Here we had Google Plus with fake accounts. Very easy. In 2003, they had a photographer there to document it. Here, everybody had cell phones, so they could document during the game. In 2003, all sketches were made kind of on paper with uh, hand drawings. Here, a lot of it was made in Photoshop or in, in kind of basic uh, computer programs. In 2003, when they wanted pictures of something, they would have to draw the outline of a giraffe. While in the 2013 run, they would of course just do a Google image search and throw some text on that and then you would have the image of a giraffe that looked a little bit more giraffe-like. So, to answer simply, technology goes with us when we design games and especially when we design LARP. So, stuff is, we use as much stuff as we can and sometimes we use hidden technology, like if you put magnets into some kind of stone, then it suddenly becomes a magical stone that can attract other stones. Mag magnets are not the newest of technology, I will grant you, but you can use this sort of thing with other stuff as well. Sometimes we use technology very obviously, usually when we're making futuristic games or when we're making contemporary games, sometimes we try to hide it a little bit more so it becomes more magical or more just hidden.
in a Stone Age game, you don't want that many cell phones. You, you do that. Do you technology hide it and obfuscate it as as yeah, yeah. in fantasy set. Yeah, yeah. What's the weirdest thing you've ever done with that? I'm not that tech savvy, so I try to keep my games very low tech. But the weirdest thing I can think of that some of my friends played was, uh, and this is a 15 year old game, it was set in a bunker. The story was in 1962, there was a, during the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, suddenly the radio says, You must go into the bunker, you must go into your, your fallout shelter. And this is where the game starts, where they're going into the fallout shelter and then it runs for 24 hours. And they get a message from the radio that the nuclear war is happening, and the whole the whole story is about getting to grips with there is no future, and if we come out, it's not exactly the future we want it to be. And at some point, while they were still in in the dark, waiting with uh, not that much lighting, they hear this huge explosion. And what the organizers had done, they had taken a wall in this bunker that was an actual basement, and they had put up uh, cardboard boxes like storage boxes you would find in any kind of basement, and behind them they had hidden like a wall about kind of this size of speakers. So when they pushed go, it gave a boom, and everybody felt there was an actual sound blast that more or less just threw them to the ground because they had taken as many big speakers as they could and just hidden them behind us, and none of the players had any idea before it just said, wham. And according to those who were there, that was kind of crazy. It was ground zero, right? Ground zero, exactly. Exactly ground zero. And, and of course, there's the more obvious stuff that's becoming available. There's some, some awesome Russian people who are doing uh, tech. One of the things they've done is they've recreated the sting, uh, sting the sword from The Hobbit. So they have a sword that is, is made out of, in this case, kind of some plastic looking thing. And uh, then whoever has the sword, it functions as a, a receiver. And whoever has an orc transmitter, just a small thing you put in your belt will transmit a pulse to the sting the sword, and then if you're close enough, the store will start glowing blue. That's pretty cool. So we got them to make some amulets for us, which we use when we do children's games. So when you're near to an orc, or whatever monster has it, then the amulet you have starts glowing. So you can see, oh, there are elves in the forest, or orcs, or monsters, or whatever we want. And that's really cool, and, and is, is very much a kind of a magical technology thing that's in the way. Does it make sense as an answer? Yeah. Yes? What events do you suggest for new players here in Denmark? Um, for new players in Denmark, I suggest going to some of the shorter stuff. There's a black box festival, which is basically small games played in a kind of theater style, black box environment. So instead of having this huge scenography and massive preparation, you come in, you do some workshops for an hour or two, you play a game for two to three hours in a, a black theater room with some lighting and some simple props, and then you're out again. Because it's simple, it's easy, and it doesn't require a lot. If you're going to one of these big crazy things, then it costs some money, it costs some time, and you need to do a shitload of preparation. So showing up for one of these festival games, I would definitely, uh, I would definitely advise on that. Also because there you get a better feeling of the game instead of the whole community and, and the whole uh, the whole costume drama craziness thing, which is also fun and nice, but doesn't necessarily teach you as much from a game design point of view, but it might be more fun from an experience point of view. So going to a large festival would be something I would definitely recommend. Right now. There's one in Copenhagen here in November, there's uh, one in Stockholm in the beginning of November, there's one in Oslo here in October, there's stuff in uh, all around the country in Denmark in kind of uh, the spring and forwards. Yeah, that would be where I would start. Also, it's cheaper. Going to Poland, living in a castle for three days is not exactly true. Even though it would be nice if it was. Aha, uh -huh. and it is now 16.01. Couldn't be better. Thank you for your time. I hope some of you found this useful. If not, thank you for staying anyway.